tonight. Democracy delayed. Pakistan voters await anxiously as vote counts face unprecedented delays, prompting cries of foul play by parties in power. Trump trumps all. The former US president has the best day of 2024 so far as he sweeps the Nevada caucuses, leaving Nikki Haley's campaign in the dust and with positive Supreme Court deliberations being the cherry on top. Putin speaks. Tucker Carlson's unprecedented interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin reveals the leader's intentions for the future of the conflict in Ukraine and the progression of diplomatic ties. And future home? Cutting-edge space exploration reveals a brand new potential Earth 2.0, sparking questions of life beyond our planet. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News on our Friday Bulletin. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Well, with the end of the week, we have lots of updates over key stories that occurred throughout the past few days. We're picking up where we began last night in Pakistan. Polls are closed, but the results are uncertain as unexpected delays in the counting of votes caused unrest and claims of rigging the elections, prompting the country's election commission to issue a late-night warning to polling officers, urging them to promptly release results even 10 hours after polls had closed. With over 100 results announced for the National Assembly, PTI-affiliated independents are in the lead. Independent candidates, the vast majority of whom are affiliated with the Pakistan Tehrike in Saf, maintain their lead, winning 60 constituencies. The Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz remains in second place, followed by the Pakistan People's Party. Official results should have been announced last night or earlier this morning. The delay has raised eyebrows, with Pakistan Tehrike in Saf spokesperson Rauf Hassan accusing authorities of tampering with election results, saying votes have been stolen. Pakistanis were sceptical about delay in results for the country's national election just one day after voters cast their ballots. 24 hours have been passed since the close of polls and the results have been unusually delayed, which the government ascribed to the suspension of mobile phone services, a security measure ahead of the election. The main electoral battle was expected to be between the candidates backed by Khan, whose Pakistan Tehrik Insaf won the last national election, and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz of Sharif. Khan believes the powerful military is behind a crackdown to hound his party out of existence, while analysts and opponents say Sharif is backed by the generals. Analysts have predicted there may be no clear winner, adding to the woes of a country struggling to recover from economic crisis while it grapples with rising militant violence in a deeply polarized political environment. Tensions in our neighbouring India now, as India's northern city of Haldwani was littered with burnt vehicles and debris a day after violence broke out over a demolition drive carried out by local authorities. Officials said the local administration had arrived at an alleged madrasa or Islamic religious school after giving it prior notice that it would be knocked down. However, a mob started pelting stones at authorities and burnt vehicles to protest against the demolition. Senior Superintendent of Police Prahlad Meena said at least two people were killed in the violence and three other people critically injured but stated that the situation was under control. Meena added that around 1,100 security personnel had been deployed in Haldwani with shops, schools and markets shut down post-violence. On the road to the White House, Donald Trump had his best day of 2024 so far. The former president was handed a political gift. An independent special counsel poured kerosene on concerns about Joe Biden's age with pointed language about the president's poor memory after concluding Biden had willfully mishandled classified documents and that his failing memory makes him impossible to convict. Trump is on a glide path to the Republican nomination. Trump romped in Nevada and the U.S. Virgin Island caucuses, continuing his unbeaten streak and making Nikki Haley's campaign feel futile. We have other there in the world news special correspondent Suzanne Chanali in Toronto, Canada with the latest. Suzanne? Anuradhi, former President Donald Trump has won the Nevada Republican caucuses by a large margin. It means that Trump will take all Nevada's 26 delegates, the system used by the parties to determine the presidential candidate. 
Briefly addressing a victory party in Las Vegas, Donald Trump said, quote, if we win this state, we easily win the election in November, end quote. Donald Trump has now won contests in three states, Nevada, Iowa, and New Hampshire, making him the presumptive Republican candidate in November's general election. He also won a Republican caucus in the U.S. Virgin Islands and incorporated territory. Although the result of the Nevada caucus was a foregone conclusion, the state will be hotly contested in the November presidential election. The vote is effectively guaranteed to be a rematch between the 2020 candidates Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Trump's next stop will be South Carolina, where he will again go ahead against Nikki Haley. Despite three defeats, she has vowed to fight on. Anradi, back to you. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Thanks again. Trump appears poised for a win at the Supreme Court. Justices expressed deep skepticism that Colorado could declare him an insurrectionist and bar him from their election ballots. With his landslide Nevada win, it's a one, two, three combo that should have Trump feeling solid about his political future, at least for the moment. In a case that could determine the presidency, the justices seem to find rare common ground, appearing poised to rule, perhaps unanimously, that states can't use an obscure constitutional provision to kick Donald Trump off the ballot. That would be up to Congress. Liberal Justice Elena Kagan got right to the point. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Conservative Amy Coney Barrett agreed. It just doesn't seem like a state call. The Colorado Supreme Court said Trump should be removed from the state's ballots, narrowly ruling he committed insurrection on January 6 and was disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. It says no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office who took an oath and then engaged in insurrection. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson focused on the amendment's specific words as another reason Trump could prevail, suggesting the provision passed after the Civil War didn't clearly apply to presidents. They were listing people that were barred and president is not there. And so if there's an ambiguity, why would we construe it against democracy? The justices also were troubled by the potential impact of the Colorado decision and how it could be weaponized by both sides. I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. People camped out overnight for up to two days to get a seat inside, but Trump did not attend. I'm a believer in our country, and I'm a believer in the Supreme Court. Uh, I listened today, and I thought our arguments were very, very strong. An update now on Tucker Carlson's interview with President Vladimir Putin. The Russian leader has said he believes a deal can be reached to free Evan Grekovich, a U.S. reporter detained last year in Russia. Speaking with Carlson, Putin said talks were ongoing with the U.S. about the journalist who is being held on espionage charges. In the interview, Mr. Putin held forth on Ukraine, U.S. presidents and the CIA. It's the first time the Russian leader has sat down with a Western journalist since Russia invaded Ukraine in 20. Russian President Vladimir Putin said in a rare interview released on Thursday that Moscow has no interest in expanding its war in Ukraine to other countries, though he said he will fight for the country's interests to the end. Putin made those comments in a two-hour interview with conservative talk show host Tucker Carlson, marking the first time the Russian leader has spoken to an American media outlet since before the invasion of Ukraine nearly two years ago. In it, Putin questioned why the U.S. was continuing to fund Kyiv's effort and said it was impossible to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than $33 trillion. Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia? make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, 
realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? In video from Tucker Carlson Network, said to be recorded on Tuesday, Putin devoted a large part of the interview to claims that Ukraine had almost agreed to a deal to end hostilities in April 2022, but that they backed away once Russian troops withdrew from near Kyiv. Now let them think how to reverse the situation. We're not against it. It would be funny if it were not so sad. <laughs> this endless mobilization in Ukraine, the hysteria, the domestic problems, sooner or later it will result in agreement. Putin also said that Moscow simply has no interest in expanding to anywhere else like Poland or Latvia. When asked about detained U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich, Putin said, in theory, he could be sent home. Gershkovich has been held in Russia for almost a year, awaiting trial on spying charges. Putin said Russian and American special services were discussing the reporter's case. The Kremlin said Putin agreed to the Carlson interview because the approach of the former Fox News host differed from the one-sided reporting of the Ukraine conflict by many Western news outlets. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping held a phone conversation with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin just ahead of the Chinese New Year. In the phone conversation, the two heads of state exchanged greetings on the Chinese New Year. She said that the Chinese people are full of hope and confidence in the upcoming Year of the Dragon and Putin said that the dragon symbolizes wisdom and strength in Chinese culture and extended his best wishes to the friendly Chinese people. President Xi Jinping said that it has become a good tradition for them to exchange greetings at the end of the year and the beginning of a coming year to summarize the development results of bilateral relations and to look forward to the future together. He also said that under their joint leadership, the government's legislative bodies and political parties of the two countries have had an active exchange and cooperation in various fields have shown resilience and vitality. The two sides have achieved annual trade volume targets ahead of schedule while people-to-people -people and local exchanges between the two countries have been in a full swing. Xi Jinping said, adding that the year of sports exchange has come to a successful conclusion. Noting that this year marks the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and Russia, the Chinese president said that China stands ready to work with Russia to continue to uphold the spirit of the mutual assistance of friendship from generation to generation and work together to write a new chapter in the China-Russia relations. Stressing the need for the two countries to intensify strategic cooperation, Xi Jinping said that it is essential for both China and Russia to safeguard their respective national sovereignty, security and development interests and resolutely oppose interference in internal affairs by external forces. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more news on China's global position, specifically Taiwan and its recent tech theft allegations. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Taiwan's new envoy to the U.S. accused Beijing of cheating in the chip-making race and stealing technology as he backed Washington's export controls against China. The U.S. has been working with allies to cut off China's access to advanced chips and chip-making tools that could fuel breakthroughs in AI and sophisticated computers for its military. Taiwan's representative to Washington, Alexander Yu, said the export controls are necessary in dealing with China, known formally as the People's Republic of China, or PRC. He argued that the West's attempt at getting the country to follow international rules by letting it join the World Trade Organization didn't work. Despite the curbs, recent reports say Chinese chipmakers expect to make next-generation smartphone processors as early as this year. But Yu cast doubt on whether this was viable, saying China has tried for years to reach Taiwan's levels of success in the chip-making industry. A spokesperson for the Chinese embassy in the U.S. called Yu's claims ill-intentioned, saying, quote, China's scientific and technological achievements are never made through cheating and stealing. Our development is always built on our own strength. Yu arrived in Washington in December to take up the role as de facto ambassador, replacing Xiaobi Kim, who's now Taiwan's vice president-elect. He's found overwhelming bipartisan political support for the island. And he hopes Congress will pass a recent Senate bill that's offering allies billions of dollars to fend off Chinese aggression. 
Queen Camilla has said that King Charles is doing extremely well under the circumstances following the start of his cancer treatment. Asked how the king was doing at an event at Salisbury Cathedral, she said he is very touched by all of the letters and messages the public have been sending from everywhere and added that it is very cheering. Meanwhile, royals attended to the king while resuming their duties. Following that story for us tonight is up there as Clifford Pereira in Yorkshire, UK with the latest. Clifford? Yes, I'm Radu. The king was pictured for the first time since his diagnosis was made public alongside the queen in a car leaving Clarence House in London to catch a helicopter to Norfolk. Buckingham Palace has said the monarch will continue with paperwork and his constitutional duties during the unspecified treatment. Before the king left London, his son, the Duke of Sussex, travelled from the US to visit him. He was seen at Heathrow Airport to follow him day. Returning to Los Angeles, where he lives with his wife Meghan and their two children. Other members of the royal family have continued with their royal duties too since the announcement concerning the king's health. The Prince of Wales attended the fundraiser for the London Air Ambulance. During the event, he expressed his gratitude for the kind messages of supporters for both the king and his wife, the Princess of Wales, who is recovering from abdominal surgery. The Princess Royal also attended official engagements, but Anne did not respond to questions about the King when asked by reporters while leaving a military barracks in Oxfordshire. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. Over in North Korea now, marking the 76th anniversary of the foundation of the regime's army today, Pyongyang threatened to annihilate those that challenge its dignity. The regime also unilaterally struck down laws related to the inter-Korean economic cooperation back in 2023 when it celebrated the 75th anniversary, a number that's considered important in socialist states. Pyongyang held a large-scale military parade and revealed its solid-fuel intercontinental ballistic missile, the Hwasong-18. Seems there are more somber celebrations this year. Thursday marks North Korea's 76th Military Foundation Day. Unlike last year, it appears the day is passing by rather quietly in the north. The regime's official newspaper, the Rodong Shimun, said on Thursday that the North's military must continuously renew and perfect its warfighting capabilities to respond and defeat all methods of warfare that hostile forces may choose to use. It also made further threats. The paper added if the hostile forces try to, quote, so much as touch the dignity of the North or its people, the military is determined to annihilate the basis of the provocation with an unimaginable strike. With tensions rising on the Korean peninsula, Pyongyang also held a Supreme People's Assembly meeting on Wednesday and scrapped its legislation related to economic cooperation between the North and South, as well as agreements that facilitated these. A senior official at South Korea's Unification Ministry told reporters on Thursday that Pyongyang's unilateral announcement of the termination of the agreement doesn't mean it is no longer effective. The official added that the North's moves will only further isolate the regime. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Astronomers have discovered a super-Earth, or a world larger than our planet, orbiting a star about 137 light-years away. A second planet, thought to be the size of Earth, may also be orbiting the same star. The super-Earth exoplanet, known as TOI 715b, orbits a red dwarf star that is cooler and smaller than our Sun. Astronomers spotted the planet using NASA's TESS, or Transitioning Exoplanet Survey Satellite Mission. Researchers have determined that the planet, estimated to be one and a half times as wide as our planet, takes just over 19 Earth days to complete one orbit around its star. The planet is actually close enough to its star to exist within the habitable zone or the distance from a star that provides a planet with the right temperature for liquid water to exist on its surface. According to the researchers, this discovery is exciting as it's the first super-Earth from TESS to be found within the conservative habitable zone. Additionally, as it's relatively close by, the system is suitable for further atmospheric investigations. 
When an intruder alarm goes off, one always expects the worst. Well, a police team in Missouri were met with not hostile intruders, but a peculiar four-legged friend who has made its way into the home. What was the fluffy guy looking for? Well, who knows? <laughs> Guns drawn and on high alert, officers from Missouri's Liberty Police Department cautiously moved into a home. The department says they were dispatched due to an intrusion alarm. Officers reported hearing noises coming from inside of the home. They entered the house and the noises continued. Let's go. We'll just start clearing room by room. Slowly moving into the residence, one of the cops sees the suspect. Oh, it's right there. It's a squirrel. They can disregard. I just saw it. Tony, now you can disregard the help. We got a squirrel in the house. Four legs and a bushy tail. The squirrel set off the alarm and triggered the law enforcement response. Uh, a squirrel in the house. <laughs> 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 The squirrel, who law enforcement has nicknamed Rocky, is still on the loose. Police advise the public who may encounter him to approach with extreme caution. <laughs> yeah, get away. Close the door. Wanted and on the loose. I guess it's up to officials to lock up the little criminal. And that's all the stories we have for you tonight, wrapping up this week. We'll see you again on Monday for more updates on key global events. See you next time. Happy weekend.